Es ist Zeit zum Beginn. Let us begin. Um, welcome back to EFT plus renormalization group. Um, today we will begin the last week of the semester and I want to show you some features of two of these well-known effective field theories which are really applied nowadays in elementary particle physics in connection to the standard model and also in connection to physics beyond the standard model which is currently looked for at various experiments both at high energies at the Large Hadron Collider and at low energies such as searches for um, lepton flavor violating decays or measurements of G minus 2 of the muon and similar observables. And today we will begin with uh, the low energy effective field series or left and I will go with you through some features of the theory. In particular I want to focus on a few selected operators at higher dimensions and uh, discuss the physics connected to those operators. But let us begin with the definition of the theory. And then go through some details. So uh, at first the definition is the energy scale at which we want the EFT to be correct. And this is the low energy scale below the electroweak scale. So that is energies below the weak scale, which is defined by the masses of the W and the Z boson, the weak gauge bosons, and uh, the mass of the top quark, which is a little bit heavier than the W and Z mass, and also the Higgs boson vacuum expectation value, which really sets the mass scale of all those particles because they receive their masses via coupling to the Higgs vacuum expectation values and the coupling constants by which they receive the masses are relatively large. That is why the masses of W, Z and top are of the same order of magnitude as the vacuum expectation value. And our theory is valid below that scale such that we can integrate out all those particles and uh, we get an approximation in power suppressed terms uh, suppressed by these masses. So the particles and fields which are relevant in our effective field theory are all the known elementary particles below that scale and we describe them in a usual quantum field theory way. So the particles are first of all the photon and the gluon with the associated gauge interactions. And then there are the fermions, namely the leptons and quarks, except for the top quark, which is too heavy. So all the leptons, including neutrinos and the quarks, but not the top quark. So five quark flavors with all their colors and six kinds of leptons um, and the power counting, which leads to uh, the um, counting of higher dimensional operators, is in momenta or the masses of the leptons and light quarks divided by um, the scale which defines the electroweak scale and we take for this the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs. And uh, clearly since uh, we work in a renormalizable, or um, let's say at least uh, in this power counting sense, renormalizable quantum field theory setup, we need QED plus QCD gauge invariance. So the gauge group is U1 for electromagnetism and SU3 for QCD color. And the quarks, for example, and the gluon have identical color transformation rules as in the full standard model. Okay, and with this we can define the Lagrangian of the EFT, which we can write as L, um, is a sum of several um, terms. And first of all, we have the standard QED plus QCD Lagrangian. And uh, then we have corrections to it coming from the effective field theory setup. So in general, in our EFT, we need all terms 
which are compatible with all our assumptions. That means we, uh, the Lagrangian is a linear combination of operators with some coefficients. And the operators can consist of all operators which contain those quantum fields and their derivatives. And uh, they are sorted according to this power counting. But uh, so we need to write down all operators. And of course, the standard QED plus QCD Lagrangian contains on only a subset. Therefore, here comes now a list, an infinite list of additional terms. And uh, actually, there are not only higher dimensional operators which go beyond QED plus QCD, but it starts already at dimension three. And we will discuss which uh, dimension three operators there are that you can compose out of those fields which are normally not part of QED plus QCD. But then there come uh, power suppressed terms, dimension five, operators, dimension six operators, and so on. Okay. You can already start thinking what the dimension three could be, but we will soon uh, um, enlighten you. And uh, just as a reference, there is a very nice paper by Jenkins, Manohar, and Stoffer from 2017, actually a series of two papers, but the first one is sufficient for us, um, where they uh, discuss at great length and with a lot of um, nice details the Lagrangian and uh, how to obtain it. So just uh, to illustrate some use cases of the EFT, so this is the same as in general, but let me just reiterate it. Uh, one use case is you start from the standard model, from the actual standard model, which is renormalizable and totally predictive. And uh, you might start from the standard model by assuming the standard model is really the ultimate truth and you want to compute very precise predictions in the standard model, such as to afterwards test the predictions against experiment and either falsify or confirm the standard model prediction. Then um, this uh, setup here provides a calculational tool for precision calculations in the standard model. You would uh, do it in the usual way. You match the full standard model and you obtain specific um, coefficients in the left Lagrangian. Which are then a prediction of the standard model and then within the low energy theory you can precisely compute using renormalization group techniques processes at low energies. So ultimately you get precise standard model computations, of course, of low energy processes. via this low energy EFT. Okay. And uh, examples of such processes are within the context of B physics, B decays, that is our exercise where we already discussed uh, exactly the same logic, but also processes like um, low energy muon processes, muon decay processes of all kinds, uh, tau processes and so on. Now, uh, an alternative would be to start from physics beyond the standard model. So BSM stands for beyond the standard model. And maybe you have a concrete ansatz, a concrete hypothesis, which you want to test against the standard model and then you will do exactly the same. And you would obtain a competing prediction, precision prediction for some low energy process coming from an alternative to the standard model and then you can compare predictions against the experiment. And an example of that would be G minus two of the muon where you can do competing calculations in the standard model and beyond. And the measurement can then decide between the two. But uh, there is also another way. If you do not uh, start from any concrete hypothesis for a high energy theory, then you can use the low energy EFT co to correlate processes in general terms 
and uh, those correlations that you derive from within left are then independent of whatever is the high energy detail. And these correlations are then obviously interesting to know. And they might guide you in understanding something about high energy physics or low energy physics that you might be interested in. So then you use left as a general parametrization. And you can study correlations between low energy observables. independently of high-scale assumptions. And maybe compare to experiment on that level and then learn something about possible realizations um, at the high scale. And we will look at uh, examples of that kind actually today. All right, so this is the setup of our low energy EFT and now let us go through the details and we will basically walk through these different terms in the Lagrangian and illustrate each of them either completely or with the help of some examples. Obviously, we will now start with a QED plus QCD level and just look at this, uh, the physics of it a little bit. And um, maybe um, I will cut it short to have more time uh, for the other parts. So at the dimension four level, let me write down the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian for QED plus QCD, let me write it in this way minus 1 over 4 f mu nu f mu nu for the photon field strength tensor, minus 1 over 4 g a mu nu g a mu nu for the gluon field strength tensor. And uh, let me not spell out the definitions in total, but uh, they are the standard ones coming from generic gauge theories of that kind. Then we have the meta field interactions or kinetic terms plus interactions given by covariant derivatives, sum over various fermions of the term psi bar i capital D slash psi. So uh, capital D slash stands for the covariant derivative for QED and QCD. And uh, which fermions do we have here? Here we have all the uptype quarks, the downtype quarks, the electrons or, or charged leptons in other words, and left-handed neutrinos. And uh, so let me not write indices here, then uh, it looks a little bit cleaner. Next, we have minus a mass term. Again, sum over fermions of the term of the kind psi bar, um, psi right bar with an index, let's say R, capital M Psi R S times Psi L S, okay? Plus the Hermitian conjugate of the same thing. And what do I mean by this? So first of all, there are the following kinds of massive fermions. There are the uptype quarks, the downtype quarks, and the charged leptons, U, D, and E, but not the left-handed neutrinos. And here a mass term is now decomposed um, in this Lorentz covariant way. Uh, namely, every spinor um, is written as a sum, maybe let me illustrate it here. Every spinor of psi can be written as p left plus p right times psi, or in other words, abbreviated as psi left plus psi right. And then a product of spinors psi bar psi uh, decomposes into psi right bar times psi left plus psi left bar psi right. And uh, we have made use of this in writing the mass term. 
And um, as we discuss in other lectures, um, each of these psi left, psi right forms an irreducible representation of the Lorentz group on its own. Therefore, there is no transformation between the two kinds. And um, the mass term in front of uh, left-handed times right-handed bar can be complex, in which case uh, it doesn't add up to the usual kind of mass term, but it um, adds up to a term that can also involve gamma 5. So therefore, this is a slightly more general um, way to write the mass term, which is, however, compatible with Lorentz invariance and uh, QED and QCD gauge invariance. And there is a mass matrix here. So these are generation indices. R and S. And um, that means, for example, for the up-type quarks, there are three up-type quarks, up-quark, charm-quark, and top-quark. And uh, here, this is basically a column vector of the three kinds of quarks. And here, we have a three-by-three three mass matrix between the three up-type quarks. And uh, since they have all identical gauge quantum numbers, nothing can stop us from writing down a term, for example, top quark bar times up quark. And uh, therefore, we have in general here a gauge invariant mass matrix. Yes? Um, but since we're interested in this low energy limit, should we actually not consider the top uh, quark in this case? Oh, uh, sorry. Yes, of course. Uh, you're right. Um, that was a bad example. But for the bottom quark, it would be bottom, strange, and uh, down quark. And for the top case, it would actually reduce to a two by two mass matrix between the top and charm. And for the electron, we would have electron, muon, and tau. Again, a three by three mass matrix. And for the neutrinos, we cannot write it down because we do not introduce right-handed neutrinos. We only have left-handed neutrinos, which is actually um, a restriction of this setup. It could be generalized to include right-handed neutrinos as well, in which case we would have here a neutrino mass matrix too. But that is just excluded by assumption. So, and then there is a final term, which I do not want to omit, um, but I write it only as a text, namely theta terms. And just one comment without going into details, these theta terms are um, total derivatives. So they do not matter in perturbation theory. Because in perturbation theory, we get Feynman rules Total derivative means that the Feynman rule is multiplied by the total incoming momentum, which is zero by momentum conservation. But the terms could matter non-perturbatively. They are topological terms which, um, whose integral can non-perturbatively be non-zero, so in the path integral they might matter. And there is some interesting physics associated with the theta terms, but uh, I will not discuss it here. Okay, and uh, since I want to use the time rather for discussing the um, new terms instead of these standard model-like terms, let me just uh, keep the discussion short and uh, mention the following. Um, without loss of generality. We could assume that the mass terms are all diagonal. M psi um, is real and diagonal. But we might not always assume it but one could go um, to a field basis by, um, let's say, by doing uh, an appropriate field transformation. Mm -hmm. 
and you know that we cannot uh, change physics by going into a different basis of the fields. Therefore, if a uh, person A starts out with a Lagrangian where these mass matrices are non-diagonal and complex, then person B could uh, change the fields, go to a different description of the fermion fields by using a matrix transformation of the fermion fields into new fermion fields, which are linear combinations of the old ones. And then for person B, the equivalent mass matrix would be real and diagonal. And that is the same procedure as what is done for the CKM matrix in the standard model. And a second remark is the following. So we have introduced here a complex and not necessarily diagonal mass matrix. Even though it is not necessary, one could also do the opposite. So the kinetic terms here are actually diagonal and have real coefficients. Is that necessary? Um, no, it is not. You could also generalize this. So one could generalize kinetic terms such that they might look like this sum over z r s psi r bar i d slash psi s, where this again is a Hermitian. That is all that is required um, matrix. So it could be um, non-diagonal, and it could also have complex entries, as long as it is overall a Hermitian matrix. Then the Lagrangian would remain Hermitian, uh, which is important. Um, but individual terms in the Lagrangian could look like a kinetic term of the form, um, not the top quark, but let's say bottom quark bar times id slash times strange quark times a complex coefficient plus the complex conjugated coefficient times strange quark bar id slash bottom and so on. And that again would just correspond to an unnecessarily complicated field transformation and you could go back without changing the physics to this diagonal kinetic term with um, unit coefficients. So um, this version of the Lagrangian comes from the paper I cited, and they assumed here uh, canonically normalized kinetic terms, but allowed for um, off-diagonal mass matrices. All right. So, yeah. Uh, in general, one would only be able to do one of those two lines. No, no. The point is you can do both of these in, uh, uh, simultaneously. So you could, for example, complicate the Lagrangian by having here a Hermitian matrix in front and here an arbitrary matrix. And um, then person B could uh, write down an equivalent Lagrangian where you have this um, unit normalized kinetic term and simultaneously a real and diagonal mass matrix. Okay. And if you start out with two arbitrary matrices in front of both terms, then you could go step by step, and I uh, could do that, but I want to save the time. In a step by step procedure, you can easily first diagonalize the kinetic term by basically um, you have a Hermitian matrix Z. Uh, a Hermitian matrix can be diagonalized with one unitary matrix, so you would do a unitary transformation of the fields Psi, go to a different basis, by unitary transformation, then the kinetic term um, has a diagonal matrix in front, diagonal and real, but not necessarily unit coefficients. So then, as a second step, you renormalize the fields, each field individually, by a factor. That is not a unitary transformation, but you simply uh, multiply each field with a factor, then the kinetic term is diagonal and has unit coefficients. And then you care about the mass matrix, 
and uh, must not change the kinetic term anymore because that is already in a perfect shape. So, but the mass matrix here can again be um, diagonalized by um, unitary transformations. And if you multiply the fields here again by unitary matrix, the kinetic term doesn't change anymore because unitary matrices drop out here if they multiply by a unit matrix, but you can diagonalize the mass matrix. And then in the end, both is diagonalized. And maybe just as a final consequence of this discussion here, uh, the importance of the discussion is the following, namely um, this Lagrangian QED plus QCD does not contain flavor changes. That is an important statement, and let me just write it down like this on the blackboard. What I mean by the statement is that you can always go to a basis where the muon is completely isolated and every process which starts with a muon ends with a muon. Similarly for the electron and the tau and all the quarks, there are no processes where the flavor is changed. Flavor is completely conserved by this QED plus QCD Lagrangian. That means all processes where you have flavor changes like B2 strange or a bottom to charm, uh, whatever, muon decay, beta decay, all these processes must be described by the other parts of the Lagrangian. Okay, that is important. And a final remark, um, when we say without loss of generality, we can assume this or that to be diagonal, then this applies to tree level three-level Lagrangian, and, uh, but not necessarily to the counter terms. Okay, but now let us go to uh, one of the new terms. And let us begin with the dimension three terms. And the answer um, to your question is uh, these are neutrino mass terms. Neutrino mass terms um, are not present so far in the Lagrangian, but we can now write them down at the dimension three level. And let me just say um, by assumption, we have uh, only left-handed neutrinos. And one could um, study also a generalized left uh, setup with right-handed neutrinos, but here uh, in accordance with the paper that I cited, we use only left-handed neutrinos. Otherwise, there would be a term nu r bar times m times nu l possible. And such a term uh, would probably be written as part of the QED plus QCD Lagrangian. But now we only have left-handed neutrinos and for them we can write down a mass term as follows. This is a so-called Majorana mass term. And it looks like this. So we have a left-handed neutrino, but take the charge conjugated spinor of it, bar, times a mass matrix times nu L, and then we might have here indices I, M, I, J, J. This is a Majorana mass term, and the difference is, compared to the Dirac mass terms, as they are called from before, is that here we have an explicit charge conjugated spinor appearing in the mass term. And uh, therefore, because of the charge conjugation, this mass term violates the conservation of lepton number because this field carries lepton number unit one. And uh, this also carries lepton number unit one because after charge conjugation and barring, um, you basically flip the sign twice. And so therefore, the mass term destroys two units of lepton number.
delta L equal plus or minus 2. And uh, phenomenologically, we do not know whether this term is non-zero or not, but we know that the neutrinos have mass, but the mass is very small. It is unknown whether neutrino mass is a Dirac mass or Majorana mass. but the mass is very small. <coughs> Certainly below one electron volt. In other words, it is compared to the electron um, uh, roughly at least one million times smaller. Okay, so much for the neutrino mass term, and uh, so this uh, then um, enters the territory of neutrino physics, which is of course a very interesting um, subfield of elementary particle physics, where one of the basic questions is indeed, is the neutrino mass um, by nature uh, coming from a Majorana mass term, which violates lepton number conservation, or does it come from a Dirac mass term, which does not violate lepton number conservation? Um, often, uh, neutrino physicists um, say the neutrino mass is physics beyond the standard model, and then there is a debate, is this actually a physics beyond the standard model or not, because you can trivially incorporate into the standard model a neutrino mass. Uh, but the point is, there cannot be a standard model of neutrino masses as long as you don't know whether the neutrino mass term should have this form or that form. So these are two completely different choices and both um, go beyond the standard model in one way. The Majorana mass term violates a fundamental symmetry which the standard model otherwise possesses, namely lepton number conservation. It's exactly preserved by everything in the standard model, but this term would violate it. So it's new physics or beyond the standard model physics in a crucial sense. In the other uh, way, you write down a mass term, you need to introduce a new degree of freedom which doesn't exist in the standard model otherwise, namely a right-handed neutrino, which has uh, additional degrees of freedom, um, which could have some physical role. So therefore, you must do a choice or uh, do both, and, uh, but anyway, we do not know how the neutrino masses actually arise, and so um, that is a discrete decision or combinations thereof. And that is why this field is interesting and it needs to be clarified until we are able to write down a standard model including a correct description of neutrino masses. Why does this consider the dimension three Because uh, it's a product of two spinors which uh, in total have dimension three. Okay, that mass term would also be called a dimension three term. Um, maybe the headline is not so perfect. Okay, um, I admit it. So, okay, so uh, um, that is just language. Not so important. But the discussion of neutrino physics is important. I hope you get the point of neutrino masses. But let us move on. Let us move on to the dimension five level. At the dimension five level, we have in particular one characteristic kind of operators in our Lagrangian, and these are the so-called dipole operators which describe things like magnetic dipole moment, G minus two, but also there is electric dipole moment and uh, generalizations thereof, and so let us discuss them here. Dipole operators. 
or like magnetic, electric, and so-called transition dipole moments. and QCD analogs. So, example, one operator is called OE gamma, and that gives rise to lepton dipole moments corresponding to the photon interaction. So, um, it is in the paper concretely written like the following. Left-handed lepton bar with a generation index P times sigma mu nu times right-handed lepton with generation index R times the field strength tensor F mu nu for the photon field. So this again are generation indices. And we will discuss the physics of this operator, but you can already um, take note that this contains electric dipole moments and also magnetic dipole moments. Generally speaking, the intuition is that sigma mu nu corresponds to the spin operator of the corresponding lepton. And here you see an interaction between the spin and the uh, uh, electromagnetic fields, and therefore this contains magnetic and electric dipole moments. Um, and uh, where transition dipole moment corresponds to the situation where you have here different indices. In other words, you might have here muon and electron combined. Um, such an operator would describe the physics that a photon interacts with an electron and transforms it into a muon via a dipole interaction. Something like this is called transition dipole moment. And then there are QCD analogs, for example, an operator O U gluon could be written like this, basically identical form. U left generation P times sigma mu nu times U right generation R times the gluon field strength tensor. And uh, that has a color index here. So you need to multiply here with a color matrix TA and uh, the color indices are suppressed, but this is of course a color triplet. This is a color triplet, and this would be um, basically half of the Gelman matrix um, in color space, the um, color generator matrices. Then this is an operator which is gauge invariant with respect to SU3 QCD gauge interactions, but it otherwise has uh, the identical form as the dipole operator from before, and so it corresponds to the QCD analog of electric and magnetic dipole moments. It's basically a color magnetic or a color electric dipole moment. That's how it is called. And so on. Clearly you can write down operators like this for all the fermions. Of course, the quarks can also interact with the photon via dipoles, up quark, down quark, photon interaction, but also down quark, gluon interaction. So all possible combinations can be written down. So let us now uh, explain the interpretation of uh, the simplest dipole operator, which is the one for leptons and photons, which will give rise, for example, to G minus two of the muon. And let us start with this, because it is the easiest to explain, and then uh, generalize and uh, give some interpretation. Or physics conclusions as well. So since it is most famous, let us start with G minus two of the muon. So we set the generation indices here to two. So P equals R equals two. And then our photon dipole operator becomes an operator for G minus two of the muon. And then the corresponding Lagrangian could be written like this. And I will add here 
a particular normalization prefactor minus QE divided by two times the following, now our dipole operator F mu nu times um, this structure here. But uh, you see the structure could be complex. It is not a Hermitian operator. So we can multiply this with a complex coefficient and add the Hermitian conjugate to it. And so we will do exactly that. So then we have here mu left bar, sigma mu nu times mu right, times some complex maybe a coefficient, C dipole star, plus the Hermitian conjugate, which is mu right bar, sigma mu nu, mu left, times the coefficient C dipole without the complex conjugation sign. Then overall, we have a Hermitian Lagrangian, which contains a non-Hermitian operator times a complex coefficient, and uh, we add the Hermitian conjugate to it. Now let us interpret this, and uh, just for reference, this convention here is from a nice paper by um, Judici. Sarah and Paradisi from 2012. Let us use the same convention here. Then uh, if we evaluate it, what uh, do we get? So this round bracket can now be evaluated and we, instead of writing it with complex coefficients, let us exhibit the real part and the imaginary part separately. So for the real part, um, real part of this uh, C dipole, so what is, uh, the um, what is the coefficient of the real part? So here we get real part times that plus real part times the other thing. So in total, this would be simply the real part times the full mu on spinor bar sigma mu nu times the full mu on spinor. because here uh, P left plus P right basically gives the unit matrix. Then the imaginary part, also maybe here, imaginary part of C dipole. So here we get I times the imaginary part times that, minus I times the imaginary part uh, times this. So the imaginary part is multiplied with minus I times, um, or, uh, Sorry, imagine here we have minus i times p right plus i times p left. p right minus p left is gamma 5. Therefore, we get the following. Now, uh, minus i times mu bar sigma mu nu times gamma 5 times the mu on field. And then you see here an operator mu bar sigma mu nu times the muon field, and that is really uh, the spin operator of the muon. And here it's uh, basically related to the spin, but via gamma 5. And so let me draw the corresponding Feynman rule then. So the fine, this Lagrangian gives rise to a Feynman rule mm. for an incoming muon and an outgoing uh, muon and a photon. The photon carries momentum Q. And what is then the Feynman rule that you derive from this Lagrangian? Well, the Feynman rule is always I times the coefficient of the Lagrangian, where a derivative is replaced by minus I times the incoming momentum. Here we have a derivative because the field strength tensor contains a derivative of the photon field. Therefore, that derivative here is replaced by minus IQ because Q is the incoming momentum into the photon field. So then I times this prefactor here, minus I times QE. And F mean U contains two terms. The two terms cancel the one half. That is why there is the one half. And then we take just one of the terms in F mean U. And then we get overall I times Q nu for the photon times the following sigma mu nu times the real part of our C dipole 
minus i sigma mu nu gamma 5 times the imaginary part of our C dipole. Like this. This is the Feynman rule. And I wanted to rewrite it just once more, minus i eq times the following, and then we have here the real part of our dipole coefficient times i sigma mu nu q nu plus imaginary part of our C dipole times sigma mu nu q nu gamma 5. So, and in this structure, it is quite straightforward to read off the physical meaning of the Feynman rule and uh, in this way of the operator and also of the coefficient, this C dipole coefficient. <coughs> Namely, the first line is directly a contribution to G minus 2, the anomalous magnetic dipole moment given by the covariant decomposition. We have already had a section on G minus 2 of the muon where I gave you how you can read off the value of G minus 2 from an effective interaction. If you have an interaction between muon and the photon um, with an incoming momentum Q, you need to separate into gamma mu terms plus sigma mu nu terms. And here, this is the sigma mu nu term coming directly from the Feynman rule. And then um, going back to the section, you could read off um, how the coefficient here can be converted into G minus 2. And uh, let's not do a calculation here, just take the result from there. Um, and the result is as follows. You get an additional contribution, let's call it delta A mu, which is given by two times the muon mass times the real part of this dipole coefficient. So with this normalization, uh, our real part C dipole is equivalent to G minus two. And so that is interesting because it shows you directly that uh, the left Lagrangian contains one term whose interpretation is explicitly and directly a value of g minus 2 up to a trivial normalization factor. And so whenever somebody gives you the left Lagrangian, you can immediately read off g minus 2 without calculation. Or in other words, a calculation of g minus 2 in the standard model can then be converted into this coefficient of the left Lagrangian by uh, reversely reading off the necessary value of this dipole coefficient from the calculated value of g minus 2. And the second term here with the gamma 5, that simply corresponds to the electric dipole moment because the gamma 5 essentially flips uh, the role of magnetic and electric fields in the F mu nu. And so whenever here you have a coupling to the magnetic field, then this generates an equivalent coupling to the electric field. And um, let me just give you the result. I do not want to uh, go through the detailed theory of electric dipole moments. And it would be a question how you normalize, for example, your definition of the dipole moment. Therefore, I will just say the electric dipole moment d mu is given proportional to the imaginary part of this dipole coefficient. And what is exactly the relationship <coughs> depends on how you define uh, the normalization of electric dipole moments. And since I do not want to discuss that, let's be content with um, the proportionality. But that gives you a clear interpretation of uh, both the imaginary and the real part of the coefficient of the dipole operator. And uh, therefore, you see here uh, the nice and simple interpretation of these operators. And that obviously explains the name. So. This is most important. Do you have any question to this? 
One question that you may have is if you really remember uh, our section on G minus two, then uh, there we did actually not um, define G minus two via this term in the covariant decomposition, but rather I said something like gamma mu terms plus terms proportional to the momenta P plus P prime of the mu one. And uh, I didn't say anything about sigma mu nu. The sigma mu nu is the obvious term that you should expect for a magnetic dipole moment, but we didn't write it down at the time. But there is a well-known identity, a so-called Gordon identity, which correlates sigma mu nu, gamma mu, and that P plus P prime mu that we had at the time. And just using this basically gives you an equivalent relationship. So sigma mu nu can be translated into that P plus P prime that we had in our section. And then comparing this, you can explicitly uh, check yourself this prefactor um, is totally in line with what we said uh, at the time. So that is fully consistent. And uh, I told you everything that you need to know in order to understand it. But here, I do not want to tell you the details today. OK, let us now generalize from this. As I said, there is not only G minus two, uh, which is a static quantity, basically a property of the muon as a fundamental particle. But there are processes described by dipole operators. For example, and let us just use some examples here. If you have such an operator in the Lagrangian, mu bar sigma mu nu e times f mu nu, that could appear in the Lagrangian multiplied with a real or a complex coefficient. And you could also have here left-handed or right-handed indices, but that is not so important right now. But just what is the physics described by this operator? This would directly give a vertex, which looks like this. You have an incoming muon, an outgoing electron, and maybe an outgoing photon. So this would, at three level, describe a process muon decay into electron plus photon, a possible muon decay, which has the name mu 2 e gamma. And a question, um, has this decay been observed in nature? Do, or in other words, is this the normal way the muon decays? What did you learn about muon decay? How does it decay normally? Yes, so instead of a photon, you would have in the final state two neutrinos, more precisely speaking, one muon neutrino and one anti-electron neutrino. But here, the two neutrinos are replaced by a photon. And in principle, why not? Because uh, the photon is neutral, electrically neutral, just like the neutrinos. And it can also carry away the missing energy. But uh, it doesn't seem to happen. And this process is called, or is a representative of a class of processes of charged lepton flavor violation. Um, because it uh, changes the generation of leptons, muon going into electrons without any compensation. And that is the difference in the normal muon decay because the neutrinos compensate for the generation change. Um, if you count the new, muon neutrino as part of the second generation, electron neutrino as part of the first generation, then the generation number of each lepton is fully conserved in the ordinary muon decay. And that is the difference here. So here, the uh, lepton generation is not con as a conserved quantum number. And apparently, nature uh, likes to preserve this lepton generation quantum number. We don't know the reason for it, but apparently it does. And so this process would be special, and it has not yet been observed. It is searched for but not yet observed. 
maybe it will never be observed because maybe it never happens. Anyway, it has not yet been observed. There is no guarantee that the muon can ever decay in this way. It might, but we don't know. Anyway, this is a process that can be described by such a dimension five transition dipole operator as we would call it. And later we will actually discuss what it means in terms of interpretation of the coefficients and um, what lessons we can learn from the non-observation of this decay. Another example, B bar sigma mu nu S F mu nu. What is described by this operator? Again, a dimension five operator, which would give rise to a decay B quark into strange quark and photon. B to S gamma decay. And that actually is observed in nature. Although it looks very analogous to mu to e gamma, which is not observed at all, but this is observed and it is also predicted by the standard model to have a non-vanishing rate. And the observation is fully in agreement with the prediction by the standard model. So this would be an example where actually precision calculations are very important and higher order corrections are huge. And the calculational technique by which this process is calculated and has been calculated um, in a long series of works is exactly this approach, namely one matches at the high energy scale, the standard model to this low energy EFT and then uses renormalization group techniques within the EFT to get as precise predictions for B2S gamma as possible. And um, with these precise predictions, there is full agreement between the standard model prediction and experiment. So this was a very big effort of the theory community, but of course also of experimentalists. And here this dimension five operator describes the process B2S gamma. So, Let us um, indeed write down a Feynman diagram for this B2S gamma in the standard model. Does so anybody have an idea how a Feynman diagram could look like in the standard model? Yeah. You could start with, for example, a gelatin group and in the propagator then just, for example, a top quark. Yes, so here, bottom quark strange quark, W, and here the photon can couple to the W boson. The photon could also couple to the top quark. But uh, this is a viable Feynman diagram. And uh, let us just uh, imagine how the result could look like. Uh, because of the heavy W mass and the top mass, the result will be suppressed by the masses of these particles, like one over MW square in first approximation. Then there are coupling constants like g square divided by 16 pi square. The 16 pi square comes from the one loop integration. The g square comes from the two gauge couplings. And uh, then what else do we have? An important factor here is the CKM matrix. So here we have uh, quark mixing and uh, the generation changes in the quark sector come from the existence of the CKM matrix. So the bottom couples to the top quark very strongly and uh, there is this um, corresponding CKM matrix element VTB which is approximately one. And here we have a CKM matrix element VTS. One of them has a complex conjugation sign. VTS, and that is not approximately one, but it is significantly smaller than one, but it is not zero. And that is the difference to the neutrino sector. So in the neutrino sector, there is not such a CKM matrix. Uh, the CKM matrix in the neutrino sector is exactly 
the unit matrix. Uh, and therefore, such matrix is, so, you, you know, you could write down the same diagram for mu to e gamma, where there is a neutrino here. But then the W boson does not couple uh, to a vertex where there is, for example, mu or neutrino, W and electron. That vertex is just zero. And uh, if you have neutrino mixing with neutrino masses, then indeed there would be such a CKM matrix analog in the neutrino sector. But uh, the suppression would be a, su a suppression where the neutrino masses appear in the numerator and they are incredibly small and therefore this diagram would be suppressed. Anyway, um, long story short, this is the contribution in the quark sector and this is not zero and uh, therefore this Feynman diagram doesn't vanish in the standard model. By the way, um, we said here this uh, that this is a dimension five operator, so the coefficient must be have a unit one over mass. Now I told you that the diagram naturally is suppressed by one over mw square. You can also see this from method of regents and so on. Um, but then the unit is actually not quite right yet, so there must be another factor in the Feynman diagram to produce a coefficient of this operator with unit one over mass. So the one over mw square is correct, but uh, so what could be another factor which could compensate for this uh, dimensionality? So we need some dimensionful quantity in the numerator of this expression. Which quantity could that be? Yep. Something like the energy of the bottom quark in the initial phase? Very good. So let's say the bottom mass. And then actually you see here, if you think about the details, and we would discuss maybe a little bit more about this later, um, the unit is one over mass, but actually the thing is much smaller than just one over mw. Namely, instead of one over mw, we have m bottom divided by mw square. That is smaller than one over mw by the factor m bottom divided by mw. So there is a, an additional suppression beyond the mass suppression, okay? That is something to keep in mind. Predicted by the standard model, but not obvious from just looking at the units of the operators that appear here. So a lesson that you can take from this is that not all operators get coefficients uh, which are just order one times the appropriate dimensional prefactor. So this operator in the standard model gets a zero coefficient. This gets a coefficient which has an additional suppression which you might not guess. Okay. So that is interesting to keep in mind. So what else do we have? Ah, here, yeah, so some discussion. Some discussion of these points. Some discussions of these points which I wanted to uh, label naive expectations versus reality. So, we have here dimension five operators. That means that uh, our dipole coefficients are definitely proportional to one over um, the characteristic mass suppression scale of our EFT, so they are proportional to one over V. But what is the prefactor? And so the naive expectation is that uh, C dipole is given by some coefficient which I call small c divided by V, and this small c naively might be expected to be of order one. Or maybe C is of the order one over 16 pi square if it arises from a loop Feynman diagram. But that would be the most naive expectation. And now let us compare this uh, most naive expectation with what we actually find experimentally <coughs> or in the standard model. And then draw some conclusions from it. First of all, 
minus 2 of the muon, delta A mu. What do we naively expect? Um, if we naively expect a contribution of this kind, then for g minus 2, we have said that uh, g minus 2 is given by the dipole coefficient times twice the muon mass. So what do we naively expect as the contribution from electroweak scale physics to g minus 2 of the muon? We expect this uh, small c divided by v times the muon mass. Let's forget about the factor 2. So, and the naive expectation would be maybe, let's put a loop factor, maybe 1 over 16 pi square or order 1 times muon mass divided by V. This ratio is about 10 to the minus 3. So you would expect a contribution of electroweak scale physics to muon g minus 2 of the order, depending on the loop order, 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 5 or so. But what is really the contribution of electroweak scale physics to muon g minus 2? We already said it. I think the contribution is 10 to the minus 9. And we did an explicit calculation of that. So reality. Um, in the standard model, weak contributions from such diagrams with W or Z bosons is given by alpha over 4 pi times muon mass square divided by MW square is 10 to the minus 9. So what do you see in comparison? Okay. The standard model contributes at the one loop level, therefore we indeed get this 1 over 16 pi square. Um, that is okay, but the standard model has a mass square suppression, muon mass divided by mw square, instead of muon mass divided by v. So there is one additional factor, m muon divided by mw. Where does this factor come from? Why is it there? And why was it not predicted by our naive expectation coming from the low energy EFT? Do you have an idea? Well, basically, mass suppression, I think it always has to come from some kind of propagator. Mm -hmm. And in a propagator, we obviously have one of the mass square directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there, it's the same, um, the same reason basically, but I, I mean, there is the same surprise happening over there because this is also doubly suppressed compared to our naive expectation. So maybe we will cover that also. But here we also have a mass square suppression and here we have a mass square suppression instead of a linear mass suppression. And so the propagator um, uh, remark is, is going in the right direction um, and uh, it's mass square in the denominator but also for the fermions we have an explicit mass in the numerator and this explicit mass in the numerator is important to get this um, spin flip that we need in the or the spin appearance um, for this interaction of a dipole and therefore, uh, we need explicitly a factor from the mass in the numerator to appear in uh, the course of the calculation. And therefore, an ex extra factor of the muon mass appears in the numerator. And that must be compensated by an extra factor of MW in the denominator. And um, so let us first collect a few surprising facts. And then I will explain you some um, theoretical understanding of this, but um, that goes in the right direction. Anyway, here we have, an, let's say, three orders of magnitude stronger suppression than uh, most naive expectation would suggest. That is interesting. So, okay, not forget about it. So there is an additional mu divided by mw suppression. which should be explained somehow. Would be nice to explain it at least. 
let's say, similar in B2S gamma. Then uh, let's look at muon decay. Um, here we had this interesting possibility of muon decay into photon instead of neutrinos. So let's look at uh, this ratio R. Let us define this ratio as the mu 2 E gamma rate divided by the normal muon decay, mu 2 E electron antineutrino and muon neutrino rate. So let us define this ratio, which can be experimentally measured or calculated in the standard model. And it can be calculated in our left theory, and we have a naive expectation for the ratio coming from our dimensional analysis. So what is our naive expectation for the rate of this so the naive expectation is that also here the coefficient is just suppressed by one over the mass times order one. Okay. If we plug in this um, expectation, then um, you need some formula to convert the coefficient into the actual decay rate. Obviously what appears is the coefficient squared because we have coefficient is the amplitude to get the rate, you square the amplitude, multiply with some phase space integral. And the phase space integral gives you muon mass to the third power times this uh, C dipole operator square. And uh, the actual rate for this here, that is known, muon mass to the fifth power times the Fermi constant square times some coefficient which are not important for us right now because we are just looking at um, orders of magnitude expectations. Now, for this we naively expect um, simply one over V square times some numerical factors which we ignore. And the Fermi constant is uh, known one over vacuum expectation value to the fourth power. Or maybe let, let us say this is given by a small c divided by um, c square divided by v square. And naively we would expect small c to be order one. But what do we now actually get? We get this small c square times what? So here one over muon mass in the denominator and v square in the numerator, v square divided by muon mass square. So what is the expectation if uh, we are totally naive and just look at the units of our low energy theory, then the small c should be one. Then we would expect that mu 2 e gamma is more frequent than the normal muon decay by a million, you know. So we should uh, almost only see this mu 2 e gamma decay and practically never the normal muon decay. But the opposite is true. So our naive expectation is totally wrong. So naive, we expect R is approximately a million. But now we can update our expectation because we have already seen from G minus two that the naive expectation is wrong by this additional suppression here. So maybe let's update and say that C is proportional to m u1 divided by V. What do we then get? Then we get R is equal to one. Right, then we would get R is equal to one. But that is still totally wrong. What does the experiment tell us? Our experiment is smaller than 10 to the minus 13. So several experiments have searched for this mu 2 e gamma decay, extremely sensitive experiments, and they have not found anything, and that means that the uh, uh, rate can be at most 10 to the minus 13 as much as the normal muon decay. So our naive and even the non-naive updated prediction or expectation is wrong by 13 orders of magnitude at least, and that means something is going on here. 
And now let me tell you what both of these observations mean for these discrepancies between naive expectations and reality, what they mean. They mean something about symmetries. What we learned here is that nature respects certain symmetries which are not part of our discussion of the coefficients of this low energy EFT. And we discover this by doing exactly these comparisons. And the first thing is a symmetry which is responsible for the additional suppression factor here of one um, power muon mass divided by MW mass. This corresponds to a symmetry which is almost exact in the standard model and apparently in nature, but not quite exact and it is broken only by a small amount namely the symmetry breaking um, parameter is exactly this ratio. And therefore, it seems that nature fully respects the symmetry up to breakings of this order. And therefore, all observables which are sensitive to a breaking of that symmetry get a suppression factor like this. And this is the explanation of the additional factor that appears here in G minus two and also in B2S gamma and in all similar observables. And what is this symmetry? It is a so-called chiral symmetry, and I will now explain what the symmetry is and how it is broken. Chiral symmetry. And this symmetry can be very simply written as a symmetry where you just take the right-handed muon and you transform the right-handed muon by a phase e to the i alpha times the right-handed muon itself. So this is a muon-specific chiral symmetry. And this is not an exact symmetry of nature. That is why you might not know about it, because it is not a defining symmetry of the standard model. And it is not even true in the standard model. But it is only broken by a very small extent. Let us figure out exactly how the symmetry is broken in the standard model. It is broken by only one single term in the standard model Lagrangian. Now uh, think of the standard model Lagrangian. You remember the t-shirt, four lines. Which of the four lines breaks this chiral symmetry? There are kinetic terms for the fermions, psi bar d slash psi. The kinetic terms, psi bar d slash psi, they connect left-handed with left-handed fermions, psi left bar times psi left, psi right bar times psi right. In these kinetic terms, such a phase drops out. Therefore, the kinetic terms are invariant. Then there are the f minu, f minu terms, have nothing to do with this, invariant. Then what else? Higgs potential, nothing to do with this. Finally, the Yukawa interactions. In the Yukawa interactions, we have interactions between the Higgs field and all the fermions, and they always connect left-handed times right-handed. So um, all the Yukawa interactions uh, are not sensitive to this, except for the one which gives mass to the muon. There we have exactly a Yukawa coupling of the muon times left-handed muon times right-handed muon. And this is the only term which is not invariant. Therefore, the symmetry is broken by the fact that the muon Yukawa coupling is non-zero. And so the muon Yukawa coupling is the breaking parameter. Y mu, which is of course given by the ratio of the muon mass divided by the Higgs vacuum expectation value. So it is a very small quantity. And in the limit that the muon Yukawa coupling goes to zero, this symmetry becomes an exact symmetry of the standard model. And uh, therefore, in the standard model, all predictions of all observables which violate this chiral symmetry um, would go to zero in the limit where the muon Yukawa coupling vanishes. So if we assume this to be true, 
in general. Then all observables which violate this chiral symmetry would vanish for Yukawa coupling of the muon going to zero. Now, g minus two. g minus two comes from the dipole operator. Let me just write it here once again. The original form was like this. Right-handed muon times left-handed muon bar. So you clearly see this violates chiral symmetry. So all the dipole operators are not invariant under such chiral symmetries. And therefore, our statement applies exactly to the dipole operators. And the statement would read like, if this um, chiral symmetry is an exact symmetry of nature, then in the limit where the muon yukawa coupling goes to 0, in particular, g minus 2 must vanish. And in particular, the dipole coefficients must vanish in the limit where the muon yukawa coupling goes to 0. And that explains the additional um, uh, suppression factor. So then the expectation from this is that the dipole coefficient is proportional to not 1 over um, the energy scale, but it should be proportional to the Yukawa coupling divided by the energy scale. And that is nothing but muon mass divided by V square. And this then is fully in line with our observation. So the true standard model prediction for the dipole coefficient is basically muon mass square over V square. And here we see exactly this. So from this comparison, we see, um, first of all, in the standard model, it is the case. This chiral symmetry is broken only by the Yukawa coupling. And then all predictions of the standard model are compatible with this statement. In particular, if you calculate the dipole coefficient in the standard model, you will find this result. And you will find the same result for B2S gamma and many other observables as well. So B2S gamma will have a suppression of the B quark mass, as we already discussed, and so on. But now, a lesson about new physics. Also, experiment agrees with this result, you know. So the experimental measurement of g minus 2 is compatible with saying that all physics beyond QED plus QCD give a contribution to g minus 2 of the order 10 to the minus 9. Otherwise, we would see a 10 to the minus 6 deviation experimentally. So any new physics at the weak scale or beyond can at most give 10 to the minus 9 corrections. Therefore, even some unknown new physics must somehow be compatible with this chiral symmetry. And there cannot be a new physics which breaks chiral symmetry, because then we would expect from such a new physics a contribution to g minus 2 of that order. And that is experimentally excluded. That shows that this chiral symmetry is probably some true symmetry, not only of the standard model, but also of extensions of it, if they are uh, supposed to be viable experimentally. Okay, so that is an interesting conclusion. So let me just write this down. So in BSM, often the same is true. So many concrete BSM scenarios have this chiral symmetry property, and then they naturally predict the same at the correct order of magnitude for g minus 2. But actually, not always. And uh, so there are some BSM scenarios where chiral symmetry behaves differently. And then those uh, BSM scenarios could give rise to g minus 2 of the order 10 to the minus 6 instead of 10 to the minus 9. That is experimentally not allowed, and that means that these are very strongly constrained.
And so if uh, your favorite BSM scenario that you have invented um, has this property of violating chiral symmetry, then you should be very careful. Then let us draw another similar lesson about uh, muon decay. So here it's even more dramatic because our naive expectation, even including chiral symmetry, now you see where the updated prediction comes from. Here we assume chiral symmetry to be already incorporated, but then we still are 13 orders of magnitude away, and that corresponds to another symmetry, much simpler symmetry, namely lepton flavor conservation. So apparently nature conserves very well lepton flavor. So that was A, B, lepton flavor conservation. So these charged lepton flavor violating operators, they have a much stronger suppression Then the naive one, even after including chiral symmetry considerations. That means apparently lepton flavor number is very well conserved. In nature. Okay. And you can express it in two ways. So maybe let's work out the two ways to express it. To state it. So the first way is the way which we have already done. Namely, we say the dipole coefficient for charged lepton flavor violating processes is basically given by um, muon mass divided by V square. This is the expectation uh, where chiral symmetry is already incorporated, but then there is an additional 10 to the minus 13 suppression, and uh, it must, at must, uh, that is the maximum it can be. It can be smaller as well. So here we have a super small coefficient in front of our naive or updated naive expectation. That is one way to say how small uh, charged lepton flavor violating processes are. And the second way would be to say, okay, um, let us assume there exists um, some mechanism beyond the standard model which violates lepton flavor, and this violation of that mechanism has order one coupling constant. So there is some new physics which kind of doesn't care at all about lepton flavor. It just violates it um, in the same style as uh, our standard model conserves uh, or predicts um, lepton flavor conservation processes. So then we would have order one coefficients and uh, then the suppression must come from a very heavy mass of the new physics. So we would have order one coefficients times a mass scale, which is the mass scale of the new physics um, fundamental energy scale, maybe gauge bosons uh, which directly violate lepton flavor. And what would that mass scale have to be um, in order to get the same? So here we have um, muon mass divided by V square, so this is maybe 10 to the minus 16 times 1 over um, 100 GeV. So it's basically 1 over Ten to the eighteen, approximately ten to the eighteen 
to EV. Uh, that sounds a little bit high. Uh, maybe you can check it yourself, but it looks like it could be around 10 to the 18 GeV, um, which would tell us that if there exists new physics which doesn't care at all about lepton flavor violating, then the mass scale associated to that new physics would have to be as high as 10 to the 18 GeV. That is how sensitive the lepton flavor violating processes are to new physics. Okay. So these are the two ways in which you can think about um, the meaning of um, saying lepton flavor number is very well conserved. Okay, that should be sufficient. Uh, we will say a little bit about dimension six on Thursday and then also do similar discussions of the other effective theory of Smith as well. Okay, then see you then.